International Alumni, Chapter USA, in association with Loyola Chemical Society. Today's lecture is presented by Professor Ravichandran Ramasamy on the topic Chemistry to Cardiovascular Research Personal Journey. To begin with, our strength is prayer, and the prayer of a humble person is the weakness of God, says Pope Francis. Our, a day without prayer is a day without blessing, and a life without prayer is a life without power, says Edwin Harvey. And St. Augustine says, to sing once is to pray twice. So let's gather up our strength, gain our blessings for the day and for the event by praying twice through a prayer song. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song it's again. It's to pray twice. So Whatever let's gather up our strength, gain our blessings for the day and for the event by praying twice through a prayer song. Let me be singing when the evening comes. The sun comes Bless up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song. song it's to pray to us. So let's gather up our strength, gain our blessings for the day and for the event by praying twice through a prayer song. Let me be singing when the evening. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. Lord, I worship your holy name. Lord, I worship your holy name. He who created us may save us. Shalom. Let's start this optimistic event with all pleasure and happiness. I request the destined Loyalite who pursued his bachelor's, master's, and doctorate, all three in Loyola College, our honorable head of the department, Dr. Suresh Kumar, to welcome the gathering online. Before we start this webinar, let us remember the two departed souls who lived with us 
in high level of association reverend father andrew father principal and treasurer of our college and professor arath trivedi former head of the department of chemistry who served the department for four decades let us observe two minutes of silence for these departed souls thank you good evening to one and all gathered here who are in india and good morning to the professors who have joined with us from us it gives me immense pleasure to welcome the patrons of our college reverend dr p francis xavier rector reverend dr selvan ayagam secretary reverend dr a thomas principal of to this meet the ever dynamic leadership of the trios is a great blessing and encouragement to all of us a special word of welcome to our deputy principal dr melkes gabriel who has been a great inspiration to all of us i welcome in a very special way the speaker of today's program professor ravichandran ramasamy professor of medicine biochemistry and molecular pharmacology new york university langone medical center new york He has been an illustrious alumnus of our department who studied his undergraduate from 1982 to 85 belonging to ec batch uh, i am uh, recalling that i studied uh, uh, two years after him in the gc batch so in that way he happens to be my senior so i welcome him in a very special way my senior and uh, his passion towards medicine and chemistry started budding from that time that he has developed himself later into a great researcher in medicine and his related fields in fact his topic of discussion today relates to this idea most strongly welcome to you sir a special word of welcome to his teacher at that time dr jeevarajan currently a senior scientist at nasa he has been inspirational and instrumental for the growth of so many students who came in touch with him is also is a nodal person Uh, for the international chapter especially for the chemistry department i welcome you sir in special way i welcome in special way the coordinator of loyola alumni usa chapter mr masiulla mohammed he literally connects people globally and he is the instrument behind all these happenings welcome to you sir i welcome in a more special way our former professors uh, who would have joined uh, this meet Uh, they have been inspirational to us during our study and uh, beyond that i welcome them all i welcome the college officials from our department dr john maria xavier vice principal shift 1 dr dorothy pushparani vice principal shift 2 dr j judy twijer dean of sciences and our shift 2 coordinator professor rajalakshmi i welcome in a more special way the president of sir sir unga mic sir please unmute your mic okay sir okay. yeah. i'm not I able to hear your voice ah yes ma'am i'm just sorry i welcome in a special way probably if i miss this one i welcome in a special way the president of lyla chemical society dr s daniel das and vice president dr limo sophie to this webinar they have been they have put in lot of efforts to make this program a grand success I welcome our dear professors from the chemistry and food chemistry division to this meet. They have been a great support to our department. I extend a hearty welcome to the alumni of chemistry department and other department members, both in India and abroad, to this webinar. I welcome my dear student friends to this webinar. You are the center stage of this exercise, and not for your benefits, and only for your benefits. This program has been arranged. 
I wish each one of you to get benefited more from this webinar. And you can interact more lively with the speaker. He's very cordial and uh, is very interactive person. So you can uh, get more uh, out of this particular webinar. So this webinar, I hope, will be a more enriching one to all of us. I welcome one and all to this uh, webinar once again. Thank you, one and all. Thank you very much, sir, for greeting everyone with your striking words. To introduce the star speaker of the day, I welcome the president of Lola uh, Chemical Society, Dr. Daniel Doss. Good evening to all of you. So, good evening to all of you. It gives me immense pleasure and honor to introduce the uh, speaker of the day, Professor Ramachandran Ramasamy. So, Professor Ramasamy is an internationally known scientist for his contribution in the field of myocardial ischemia, hyperfusion injury, and heart failure. <clears throat> he, has, he has done a lot of work in this field. Professor Ravi has you know, completed his graduation in our college in the year 1985. And then he has moved to you know, La, <clears throat> you know, USA in the Loyola University of Chicago, Illinois. He completed his PhD in the year 1989. And subsequently, he has done postdoctoral work at the University of Texas, Dallas, and the Southwestern Medical Center. Then he joined in the UCLA, the University of California Davis, as an instructor and rose to the ranks of assistant professor in 1992. Then he moved to Columbia University Medical Center in 1997 to embark on the myocardial metabolism and diabetic complication research. There he rose to the professor, associate professor, you know, there. And then in the year uh, 19, uh, 2010, he has moved to the New York University Langone Medical Center. And uh, till now he is there and he has become full professor of biochemistry, molecular pharmacology and medicine. He is the principal investigator of uh, Diabetes Research Center at New York University on um, Abu Dhabi Research Institute. So uh, Professor Ravi has done, uh, you know, published a lot of you know, papers in the peer reviewed journals, more than 100 papers he has published. He also, you know, uh, written a lot of chapters in the books, many books he has written, books and the chapters in the books. So he is, you know, we are very fortunate to have him today as a speaker so that, you know, the uh, student community will get benefited by his uh, rich experience. Uh, <clears throat> I'm very happy to uh, invite uh, Professor Ramasamy. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, th th thank you very much. Can you see my slides? Yes, sir. Yes, okay, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Very good to see you. Very good to see you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the lovely introduction. Uh, before I get started on the uh, talk, I wanted to thank uh, some of my uh, professors at uh, Loyola college uh, chennai uh, some of them who are instrumental uh, and uh, basically an inspiration for me to do what i've uh, been doing so far and first uh, i would like to thank uh, two of the great stalwarts at uh, loyola college madras one is uh, professor uh, a srinivasan and professor nyana prakasam and uh, importantly, I want to thank Professor Ramamurthy and uh, Professor uh, Santanam, uh, along with uh, Dr. Jeevarajan for uh, some of the early seeds of inspiration they put in my head. And uh, whatever I'm uh, presenting today started with some of the uh, seminars we had uh, over there. And it started with, uh, you know, how can chemistry be leveraged for uh, really treating diseases? That was the seed that was put into my head. And some of the other areas that was put in my head was basically how can you use uh, some of the state of the art techniques. So that is going to be the overall theme of what I'm going to talk today. So this particular slide uh, pretty much summarizes uh, my journey. Basically, you know, starting from chemistry, and I, I think you all know when you go walk into the Adnapalli Hall, you'll see the big uh, periodic table there. 
and what has fascinated me uh, in those days was you know how I mean the how, slide did not move okay so I don't know about others did that slide move? because you're looking at the second slide right yeah the second slide can you see now Suresh can you see can you see now uh, yeah yeah now I can see yeah that's right yeah go yes ahead. yes I'm sorry I'll use this mode I think when yeah. I use the power of no MMPC this no MMPC is Sorry about that. Uh, so, if you look at uh, what, uh, so the uh, essence of it is uh, basically it started with uh, in Ebnapoli Hall. When you look at uh, the massive periodic table that we had, I, I'm assuming we still have that. Uh, so, what fascinated me was uh, this periodic table. There's so many elements, and uh, you know, there's so many fascinating things this could do, and that's what uh, really started my. Uh, you know, in the final year, I, we had to make those presentations on uh, some of the topics of interest. And I presented a uh, talk on uh, how uh, platinum compounds are used in chemotherapy in those days. And it started with cisplatin. And that stuck in my head. I said, metals in medicine, that's a fascinating topic I want to pursue. And that's what uh, led me to the journey where I am today. And obviously, you will see that, uh, you know, whatever I've been doing, it's how science has led me to where I am. So basically, the journey in a nutshell is, you know, you have all these fascinating molecules that are being made. How do you translate them into uh, tangible molecules? How do you get it to the clinic? In other words, you know, what are the process I've gone through? And I will give you a practical example of one of the drugs we, which was made in my lab and how it's being tested in diabetic patients today. And uh, one of the fascination for me came from the use of NMR spectroscopy. And I was fortunate to learn so much fundamental aspects of NMR spectroscopy while I was uh, there at uh, Loyola College. And that basically strengthened my thoughts towards using NMR spectroscopy as a diagnostic tool to really look at, uh, you know, how I can translate a molecule to the clinic. Okay, so uh, in essence, uh, this is a slide, I'm sure you're, I mean, I don't need to convince any of you that chemistry is integral for anything and everything on earth that you look at, be it uh, engineering, be it environmental sciences, be it forensic science. And my fascinating one is medicine and biochemistry. Okay, so let me take you through step by step. Uh, and uh, so in a, in a comprehensive way, what I'm going to uh, share with you is uh, what is my journey towards discovering the drug for diabetic complications? This is one aspect of research that we do in our lab. Okay, um, so when I first uh, finished uh, uh, undergraduation at Loyola College uh, uh, Chennai and moved to Loyola University Chicago, um, I was fascinated with one of the professors working on lanthanide elements and how they can be used for contrast agents or shift reagents for NMR spectroscopy and imaging. Okay, and that uh, his the professor's name is uh, Professor Duarte uh, Mota de Freitas. So with him, uh, what we did was basically for my thesis, we discovered a lot of these reagents that can be used to study sodium and uh, lithium in cells. Okay, and the reason why I was fascinated by looking at uh, lithium and sodium in cells was that uh, it gave me an idea that sodium regulation in uh, in the body, especially in the cells, has been linked to hypertension and uh, manic depressive disorder. So first and foremost, we used uh, we made a lot of these complexes uh, that will help you identify what amount of sodium is inside the cell and outside the cell and what amount of lithium is inside the cell and outside the cell. So if you were to take uh, sodium or uh, uh, lithium NMR spectra of blood or any tissue, all you will see is one peak. In order to be able to differentiate what is inside the cell and outside the cell, we made these reagents. And as you can see in these in this slide, if you just take a regular spectra of uh, blood, you will see one signal for lithium or sodium. And when you uh, put a shift reagent, the shift reagent does not cross the membrane. It stays outside. And we were able to distinguish what is inside from outside. When you look at the shifted peak, uh, that is the one that is uh, on the outside, whereas the intracellular peak stays at the same chemical shift. So we made these different shift reagents that were lanthanide complexes. One was a polyphosphate-linked uh, 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 dysprosium, and the other one was thulium-linked uh, dysprosium. Uh, these are the two lanthanides that have been characterized to 
cause shift uh, from the intracellular. And we also made another complex, which is the uh, hexaacetic acid moiety uh, containing uh, ligand. And with this, we were able to also shift the intra and extracellular resonances. So in my PhD thesis, it was all about uh, characterizing these uh, shift reagents and uh, basically understanding the chemistry of the shift reagent and how it can be used uh, in biological or in, uh, in, uh, you know, in clinical research, okay? And then I wanted to know more. I mean, I wasn't uh, happy with just looking at cells. I wanted to be able to see the whole thing in, uh, in, the, uh, in vivo. So first and foremost, I decided uh, at that point after my PhD, I wanted to get some training, uh, postdoctoral fellowship training on uh, using NMR spectroscopy for in vivo application. And this is to tell you how we made a home built, uh, in, uh, inbuilt system uh, to look at the heart inside the NMR magnet without flooding the magnet. And here we were basically interested in looking at a functional heart inside the magnet and we were looking at sodium and uh, phosphorus NMR spectroscopy. So initially for the postdoctoral fellowship, we also uh, designed these coils that can be used for whole animal as opposed to isolated organ. So the training was very robust. So I was able to learn a lot of new things about how to make the coil, how to make the setup that I can use for uh, looking at anything in, in vivo. So in, on the first aspect, well, this is uh, from a beating heart uh, inside the magnet. Uh, what we did in this heart was uh, we used the shift reagent to see what is inside the heart and what is outside the heart. And then what we did was we stimulated heart attack in, this, uh, in the heart. The heart is beating, right? So what we did was when we shut off the flow, the heart attack happens. In other words, the heart is unable to get oxygen. It's unable to beat. And when you see uh, the sodium changes during the uh, heart attack, you see that the intracellular sodium goes up, okay? And uh, we used uh, this approach to really look at what happens in a diabetic heart uh, during ischemia and during reperfusion. Well, in reperfusion, what it is is, you know, when we cause ischemia, we're shutting off the flow to the heart. When you reperfuse, this is similar to what happens in uh, uh, bypass surgery. You remove the block. <coughs> Sorry. When you remove the block, you're able to get the flow back to the heart, and the heart is coming back to normal. The sodium uh, that has risen during ischemic phase starts to come down. This recovery of sodium can predict how uh, the heart is going to recover and how much injury happens. And this is basically showing that in both the diabetic and the non-diabetic heart, the rise in intracellular sodium uh, is quite distinct. You know, if you look at the left panel, it's about diabetic heart. In the right panel, it is the non-diabetic heart. The rise of sodium is much more rapid in the non-diabetic, and the fall is also much more rapid, whereas in the in the uh, in the diabetic settings, it's much more, uh, what do you call, nuanced. So this basically led me to ask this question, what is the energy of the heart at that point? Because for the sodium to be coming out of the heart, uh, out of the cells in the heart, uh, it requires ATP. So we were monitoring the ATP using phosphorus NMR spectroscopy here. When you look at the heart using phosphorus NMR spectroscopy, you will see prominent signals for phosphocreatin uh, for the ATP, the three resonances of ATP, alpha, gamma, and beta ATP. Uh, and again, when you make the heart ischemic, uh, your, your ATP, your phosphocreatin level goes down along with ATP. And then when you do the reperfusion, the ATP is recovering. So basically, the NMR gave me an opportunity to really look at uh, real-time changes in energetics of the heart and sodium in the heart, okay? This was my postdoctoral training. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I said, well, I'm tired of uh, working on the methodology. Let me see how I can put it to use. And personally, diabetes was very, very close to my heart because we have a lot of family members who are afflicted with diabetes. And a few of them passed away with diabetic heart disease. So I said, this is what I'm going to work on. So when you look at the diabetes numbers today, I mean, it's staggering. You're talking about close to 500 million adults with uh, diabetes today and these are people that have been diagnosed and this number will increase to even greater than 700 million by the time uh, 20 
45 comes around. <clears throat> and what is uh, very, very sad is that, I you know you're seeing about four to five million people are dying from diabetes each day. And if you look at the major uh, reasons for the uh, death is that the complications that is caused by diabetes. And again, diabetes causes complications from head to toe. And my interest is particularly focused on the heart. You know, why do diabetics go into heart failure? And that is what I did uh, when, <clears throat> when I started putting together a grant proposal for what I wanted to do. And if you look at uh, the part that is very, very important is that you will see that when people have diabetes, even without any cholesterol accumulating uh, in the vessels or even any kind of uh, blockage, you, you do see a phenomenon called diabetic cardiomyopathy. And in that uh, instance, what happens is that the heart is not able to meet, beat strongly as a consequence of some of the metabolic and signaling changes that goes in the heart. That's what fascinated me towards this. And, uh, and again, if you look at diabetics who have had a heart attack, the recovery is very, very poor. Okay, so these are two important aspects that I particularly uh, have been focusing on since the early 90s. I know it looks like a long time, but trust me, uh, in science, uh, things are fascinating. It moves on uh, quite, uh, it, you know, in a, in a manner that you won't, you, you basically lose track of time. Okay, so before I go on to talk about my research, there are some fundamental concepts that I want you to keep in mind uh, about the heart. So that will help you understand some of the discoveries we have made. First and foremost, if you take a normal person and you look at the heart, heart requires a lot of ATP or the energy molecule to be produced. The heart uses a lot of glucose and a lot of fatty acids. In a normal heart, you would be surprised to know that it, it prefers fatty acids over glucose for ATP requirements. So in a normal heart, you will see uh, on the left, uh, when I say palmitate, this is a prototypical fatty acid. It can go into the mitochondria to generate the energy. And if, uh, if some of you have learned the uh, biochemistry, this is what happens in the ATP is generated mostly in the TCA cycle and some of it in glycolysis. Um, and when you when you make the heart when when a person suffers a heart attack, what happens is that the flow to the heart is restricted. As a consequence, what you will see is there's very little generation of ATP by the uh, uh, mitochondria or the TCA cycle. That is, uh, it's relying mostly on glycolysis. Since glycolysis does not meet the demand of the uh, energy demand of the heart, you basically have a problem. Right, So the heart is unable to uh, beat normally. That's why when people go into a heart attack, they have an excruciating chest pain followed by, you know, gasping for, uh, uh, you know, oxygen or shortness of breath. Okay. And in that condition, you, you are not getting a robust metabolism. So we figured uh, basically if you are able to uh, improve the metabolism, you would be able to uh, improve you'll be able to improve the heart function. So the other thing I wanted you to take, keep in mind is that most of you are aware of uh, glucose uh, being metabolized by glycolysis and uh, going through oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria. But what we discovered in the heart was that this particular pathway is turned on in uh, stress conditions. Uh, this con uh, pathway is called the polyol pathway. It basically takes glucose and for makes sorbitol. And from sorbitol, it gets converted to fructose, and fructose can further enter into uh, the uh, me metabolic state. So this particular pathway in diabetes and in heart attack is very detrimental. That's what we discovered, and that's what I'm going to share with you, uh, how we uh, identified that. And what we also identified was that when you, uh, when you increase the flux via this pathway, you affect the energy production by glycolysis as well. So let me take you through step-by-step step how we discovered. Um, and in some of the helpful features that we used, one was basically use labeled glucose and NMR spectroscopy to follow the tracer. So if you use a carbon labeled, uh, if you use glucose labeled at C1 and uh, C2 carbon, you can basically see how it goes through glycolysis 
how it goes through uh, the, the mitochondria and how the equilibrium product that you generate uh, gets labeled. So the idea is to basically follow the tracer and I determine what is going on with the glucose, <coughs> especially in the diabetic hearts and the non-diabetic hearts, okay? Now, the other thing, we, so first and foremost, we wanted to look at uh, what happens in the uh, diabetic heart. And uh, so at the bottom panel is what, when you give labels in a normal heart, you will see labeling in lactate indicated by L3. You will see labeling in glutamate, which is the equilibrium product of the mitochondrial metabolism. In the diabetic hearts, you barely see labeling in lactate. You barely see any mitochondrial uh, 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 equilibrium product glutamate. So we said, what happens if we inhibit the aldose reductase? Is aldose reductase causing the glycolysis deficit? And, uh, and indeed, uh, we did see that when you inhibit aldose reductase in the diabetic heart, you see lactate labeling and you also see glutamate labeling. So this suggested to us that this pathway is quite detrimental in the diabetic heart. Okay, so the, and then we looked at the uh, ATP levels in the heart uh, with and without the aldose reductase inhibitor using NMR spectroscopy. And here, I, coming back to the slide I showed earlier, in these hearts, what we did was basically treated the heart with the aldose reductase inhibitor de designated by uh, DZ. Uh, and what we noticed was that in the heart that were given the uh, aldose reductase inhibitor, uh, the rise in sodium was very, very, uh, reduce, uh, and as a consequence, the heart recovered better. Even in the non-diabetic settings, when you subject them to a heart attack and recovery, the uh, heart is protected. So this data actually informed us of two things. One is that this pathway is highly active in the diabetic heart, and two, it is also active in a non-diabetic heart during a heart attack condition. So if you superimpose the two, you have a massive increase uh, in the outcome in terms of ischemia recovery. One of the aspects that is very critical when you see rise in sodium is the compensatory rise in calcium. You know, calcium is hard to look at by calcium NMR because of the visibility and sensitivity issues. So what we used was a fluorinated uh, calcium indicator that binds to free calcium. And we looked at the intracellular calcium in the heart in the presence of the aldose reductase inhibitor. And uh, during ischemia and reperfusion, what we noted was that the diabetic hearts had, mo had more intracellular calcium even uh, at a basal state. And when you when you look at ischemia or heart attack, they continue to rise. And on reperfusion, the heart uh, calcium doesn't recover. They, it continues to go up. And as a consequence, the heart is not recovering. What I would like to also uh, basically uh, uh, say is that in our uh, earlier findings, we basically uh, showed that when you have increased aldose reductase activity, be it in ischemia or in type one or type two diabetic animal heart, you increase the aldose reductase activity and you impair the glycolysis. And as a consequence, what you're doing is you're impairing sodium and calcium. That is very, very uh, detrimental and it leads to increased injury in the heart. So in the clinical settings, how do you measure injury is by looking at some of the, uh, what do you call damage molecules that are released in circulation. For example, when a patient gets admitted, what they will do is they'll measure uh, creatine kinase levels, they will measure troponin level. Those are markers of injury. And that's exactly what we did in the animal models as well. Okay, now, you know, when you use all these uh, inhibitors, uh, you know, one of the challenges that you have is the specificity. How do you know that this particular uh, molecule is exclusively attacking uh, the target of interest? Are there any off-target effects? So when you write a grant and you send it for uh, funding, these are the questions that come back. So in order to address that, what we did was we developed a mouse model where you can express this particular protein of interest uh, in, the, uh, in the animal and basically recapitulate what goes on in a stress condition and diabetic condition. So here, we, what we did was we used a human aldose reductase uh, cDNA and we expressed this in the animal 
And basically, it is expressing everywhere uh, this particular uh, promoter is expressed. And what we noticed was that this particular mouse had the aldose reductase level similar to what is seen in a human heart. Okay, so basically, this uh, with this approach, uh, the idea is that if you have the aldose reductase at that level, it's higher than what you see normally. So if you induce heart attack, do you have more injury? And does it does the heart recover uh, uh, poorly? So before we did those studies, we wanted to characterize what are the cell types that uh, this aldose reductase, human aldose reductase is expressed in. And what we noticed was that it is expressed in the endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells, and the circulating macrophages, as well as in the heart, in the cardiomyocytes in the heart. Okay? And uh, so first and foremost, as I said, we need to measure, we need to induce heart attack in these animals. We use three different models of heart attack. And what I can tell you in all the different heart attack models, the human aldose reductase expressing mouse had higher injury after heart attack uh, and had poor functional recovery uh, after a heart attack. Okay, and when you treated them with an aldose reductase inhibitor, basically you're able to, uh, you know, reduce the injury and improve the functional recovery, as well as you're able to improve metabolic recovery as seen by the ATP uh, recovery. Now, if we've also made another transgenic mouse where we have deleted the aldose reductase into the, in the entire mouse, and there actually the hearts recover much better as uh, seen here, okay? Just for, uh, you know, uh, brevity, I'm not showing that data. Now, the other thing in the transgenic mice studies, what we established was that, again, uh, it, uh, it is basically linked to the glucose uh, metabolism changes that I showed earlier with the inhibitor studies. Okay, so clearly these are, uh, I, these are proof of concept forming uh, data. Uh, now, you know, it's, you know, when you see all these data, one of the things, uh, you know, you come across when you present it to a clinical audience is that, yeah, it's fine. You have cured the heart attack in the mouse model. You have cured the diabetic heart disease in the mouse model. So how relevant is it to the human uh, studies? So uh, the, these are data not by our group, but other people who have published showing that the polymorphism for this gene, aldose reductase gene, if it is present in uh, people, it leads to most of the diabetic complication. So all these data in the literature gave us a lot of uh, support that indeed the model that we are studying is relevant and we need to basically continue our uh, goals of translating. Okay, now, you know, in order to understand the energetics, why does aldose reductase inhibition, uh, you know, lead to poor injury? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the mitochondrial metabolism is impaired. And what we were focused on is the mitochondria getting very leaky and therefore causing more injury. And the next set of data basically shows that uh, that's what is happening. You're uh, you're basically causing leakiness in the mitochondria and with the in the transgenic mice it is even more severe under ischemic conditions and uh, when you basically block uh, the uh, aldose reductase you're able to protect the heart by actually plugging the leakiness in the mitochondria okay so basically what uh, these data informed us was that the energy deficit is uh, is very very uh, what do you call this, multifactorial. And as a, uh, as a result, we, we barely understand what's going on. So the next aspect of it, what we did was, does it lead to, uh, uh, you know, what is the consequence of mitochondria being leaky is that it uh, generates a lot of reactive oxygen species. These are highly reactive toxic species that can modify the proteins and cause permanent damage. So by giving an aldose reductase inhibitor, you're able to reduce the toxic species production. So in terms of signaling, we noted that, uh, you know, one of the consequence, you know, as I said, the, the mechanisms are multifactorial in our quest to understand comprehensively. What we noted was that some of the key signaling pathways that decides whether the heart goes into a good remodeling or a bad remodeling, this particular pathway called the JAKSTAT pathway is quite active. And that's what we noticed is that the aldose reductase activity turns on this particular pathway that is detrimental to the heart, 
Okay, so in essence, what our comprehensive findings are that uh, you know uh, aldosterone flux leads to injury via these comprehensive mechanisms. You know, I would not go into the details because it it's it's a, an own uh, story by itself. But uh, you know, these are all published information. So if you were to do a PubMed search or a Google search, you will find all my papers that have been published with our team members. Um, so the other aspect, what we noticed was that in the uh, in 2010, one of the questions that arose when we were looking at the uh, studies in diabetic hearts is that why does aldose reductase lead to lipid uh, abnormalities? You know, we, we're saying that this only affects the glucose, but not uh, the lipids directly. So what is happening there? Uh, in in these studies, what we were able to show is basically that. Uh, aldose reductase flux of glucose is one thing, but it also in, does what is known as a moonlighting function, that it is basically interacting with uh, one of the cofactors that is a histone deacetylase uh, 3 cofactor. Uh, histone deacetylase 3 regulates lipid metabolism in the heart, in part via some of the uh, transcription factors called the PPAR uh, gamma. Uh, and basically what we noted was that aldose reductase interaction led to lipid accumulation via this mechanism. So now we understand that uh, aldose reductase not only affects the glucose metabolism, but it also affects the lipid metabolism, leading to lipid toxicity in the heart. So the other aspect we noticed, as I mentioned, the heart uh, can get injured in the muscle. It can also lead to the cholesterol accumulation can lead to blockage of the vessel. And in these studies, uh, we were able to show that uh, atherosclerosis is accelerated when aldose reductase is present at higher levels and inhibiting aldose reductase basically uh, protects the heart by reducing the atherosclerosis formation. So, <clears throat> so this is the uh, stuff that you have more interest to you because from a chemistry perspective. So what we did was uh, simultaneously we were working with some of the uh, talented uh, medicinal chemists in our program. So aldose reductase inhibitors, uh, some of the carboxylic acid family of molecules have been known to inhibit uh, aldose reductase. We took these molecules that have been tested to be safe in humans, but they failed the clinical trial. And we basically made some modifications of this, uh, this particular molecule called Zopolristat, which is, which is considered to be the best in class in the early 90s, okay? And what we did was uh, modified that molecule and we came up with this molecule called AT001. Uh, initially, we called it ASW001 uh, and when the company Applied Therapeutics uh, took it over, they labeled it as AT001. And what we observed was that it is the potent inhibitor of aldose reductase. Uh, the IC50 values were 29 picomolar. The zopolristat, which was until then the best in class, was only 10 nanomolar. So obviously we have a very potent molecule. And what was exciting for us was that it was easily absorbed and active uh, in, uh, in uh, mouse studies. And importantly, uh, basically it was uh, non-toxic for the liver, in the liver microsome studies. Okay, so then what we did was, uh, you know, we put that in the heart, uh, in the whole animal and uh, in the heart attack model, and we looked at injury in the heart and the molecule uh, ASW or AT001 was basically able to protect the heart even at a lower dose compared to uh, Zopolrostat. And uh, what we did was when we do the uh, animal studies, we use echocardiography to look at uh, functional changes in the heart. The mouse is anesthetized and we can measure the function. And what we noticed was that the functional recovery in the heart after an aldose reductase inhibitor, AT001, was very, very significant. So this, all the data that we have so far form the basis for the clinical trial that is uh, ongoing right now. Uh, the, the company that is doing the aldose reductase tri trial is uh, uh, Applied Therapeutics. And basically it is a multi-center, uh, you know, placebo controlled uh, study, a two part study. I can tell you that it was successful in phase two. It has been, uh, it's now undergoing phase three to really look at uh, the, uh, cardiomyopathy patient, diabetic cardiomyopathy patients to see if we can protect uh, these patients from 
uh, you know, functional decline. And uh, this, the study will be, the clinical trial will be completed uh, late next year. And uh, the interim study, interim uh, outcome so far has been very, very positive. So we are hoping that uh, the study will lead to a new drug that can be used by patients, diabetic patients who have heart disease, okay? Now, where are we uh, right now um, is basically we, I've given you an example of how you can take your molecule or idea of interest and how we can take it to the clinic, okay? So the fundamental aspects are, if I were to put it in a nutshell, one is uh, make sure you validate the target, make sure you have good proof of concept st uh, studies done to make sure that the target you're looking at is viable. And two, uh, it is uh, basically relevant for the disease process. Second, what you need to do is, uh, you know, you have to work with the uh, clinical people to look at uh, validation using some of the polymorphism studies that are available, okay? And three, what you need to basically do is use the polymorphism data to see you know, what kind of a patient that are likely to be benefiting from your molecule of interest. And, and most importantly, what you need to do is address the mechanisms for, the, for your target very comprehensively before you start taking the molecule towards, commercial, towards uh, clinical trials, because these are all the information that is very, very helpful when you take it to, the, uh, when you take it to FDA, FDA, for example. Um, and and what, what I would uh, basically say is that, uh, you know, where we are right now, so what I have presented to you is one aspect of what goes on in my lab. The second aspect of uh, research that goes on is, is basically, uh, you know, a receptor called the uh, uh, receptor for advanced glycation end product. Now, Glycation uh, product is are formed in diabetic uh, patients, and this causes uh, impaired cardiac function. And <clears throat> basically, what we are doing is uh, connecting the aldose reductase pathway with this receptor for advanced glycation product and products, and how they synergize with each other and amplify the disease process. <clears throat> and again. What is uh, important is that, you know, the study was not done by, uh, I, I shouldn't be taking credit for uh, most of the stuff that, that has been presented here because without the team and without the collaborators, uh, it's not uh, possible, right? And some of the wonderful collaborators I've had are shown here, Professor Schmidt, who we've been working together for the past uh, 25 years. We have a number of uh, publications together. And one of the key person in my lab who initially started this work was uh, Dr. Ananta Krishnan. Uh, she was instrumental in establishing a lot of the proof of concept data. And some of the collaborators that I've worked with in the past are Professor Goldberg and Professor Blainer at Columbia. And again, the two wonderful gentlemen from Pfizer, Dr. Oach and Dr. Mailari, who have been helpful in helping me uh, you know, make these molecules and test it in uh, humans for clinical trial. And uh, late Professor Williamson, uh, who has been basically instrumental in uh, guiding me through some of the uh, metabolic mechanism that I was uh, seeing in these hearts. And again, uh, uh, Ken Gabay, Professor Gabay from Baylor, uh, who basically was one of the co-discoverers of aldose reductase in the retina in the 1960s, when we discovered it in the heart, the first person I reached out to was him and he was so excited. And he said, you have a system where uh, the heart does not have competition from aldehyde reductase. So you have a specific system that you can test your uh, complications model in. And Professor Monier at, uh, at uh, Case Western, who helped me uh, develop some of the methodologies to look at uh, some of the metabolites using mass spectrometry, which I didn't share uh, at this moment because they're, that's part of the other project. And again, I have been fortunate to have some of these wonderful uh, lab people who made all these studies possible. Uh, and again, uh, these are people who have worked in my lab and who have gone on to become faculty in their own right. Uh, uh, one of them is uh, a faculty at Shastra in, uh, in, in, in Tamil Nadu. And one of them is a faculty uh, here in uh, Minnesota. And again, we've had a number of people who have gone on to uh, uh, academic uh, pharma careers. 
And then uh, the current uh, people I have are Gautam, who's a senior scientist, and Saeed, who's a postdoc. They're looking at the immune uh, uh, access to Aldous reductase. How does the immunological setup get impacted by Aldous reductase flux? And again, uh, and I wanted to thank each and uh, every one of you for coming for this talk. And I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you. And one thing I wanted to highlight to you is that whatever I have presented may look complex and complicated. Trust me, it is not. It is how the science has led me to where I am. So follow the leads in science. Whatever your research has shown you, just follow the leads and you will get fascinating discoveries. And as you would notice that, uh, you know, starting from chemistry, the fundamental concept of what uh, we understand in chemistry is so helpful. It's uh, almost like uh, child's play to uh, use that approach to learn on things in molecular biology, learn on things in physiology. Trust me, you know, even, even to this day, if there is a class on uh, uh, newer technologies, I go in and sit in and I actually take the test for these classes. So I understand these the methodology. For example, uh, what I'm uh, learning now is how do you use uh, transcriptomics techniques, how do you use single cell genomics techniques to really understand what goes on in the cell cell communication? How does the heart cells communicate with the circulating cells in order to get into that line of work? I'm actually learning all these techniques. So, <clears throat> so, so the bottom line is as chemists, it's easy for you to learn whatever uh, that uh, I've presented here. And I hope, and I'm pretty sure that most of you will uh, be uh, you know involved in some research careers in your life and i wish you the very best and again i thank the uh, dr jivrajan for uh, asking me to be part of this and dr suresh for the wonderful opportunity and again thanks to each and uh, every one of you i'm sorry i don't know each one of you personally but i'm happy to interact with you and feel free to ask me any question no question is uh, uh, you know silly or simple every question is important thank you Thank you very much, sir. Now, now we can uh, ask questions to sir for any clarifications. Uh, yes, sir. I'm yes. from. Yes, I belong to first year PZ Chemistry Department of Loyola College. Okay. Yes, sir. I just want to ask something on uh, chemical that causes the hurt damage or the hurt dysfunctioning so some chemicals like pops thalates bpa and hydrocarbons and dioxins are some of the names that we come across as a student so yeah. sir do these chemicals enter the body eventually through the bloodstream or do they originate from the genetically or how did they just arise from the heart muscles or which makes us to like cause severe dysfunctioning of our heart Oh, excellent question. So, so what happens is some of these toxins, there are different uh, ways in which they can get to the heart. One is, uh, you know, absolutely true. It can come via the circulation. Second is what happens is there are secondary effects. For example, some of these chemicals may be uh, taken via the subcutaneous process, okay? And what happens is that the immune cells uh, in, that are interacting with the subcutaneous region uh, goes into circulation. <clears throat> and then what happens is there is a crosstalk between these uh, circulating immune cells and the heart cells uh, based on uh, the interaction this toxin has had with uh, these immune cells. Let me give you a more tangible explanation. Some of these toxins, what they do is they, they release what is known as damage-associated molecules. Okay, and these damage associated molecules, they are, uh, you know, put out in the bloodstream. These damage associated molecules happen when these toxins interact with some of their cells, immune cells or endothelial cells or skin cells. And these damage associated molecules enter the bloodstream and these damage associated molecules, when they enter the heart, it causes massive inflammation in the heart. It causes contractile dysfunction in the heart and that's how they damage the heart. So that is one tangible explanation for that. Thank you, sir. Good evening, sir. Dr. Ravi Ramasamy. Uh, 
this is Dr. Johnson from the Department of Chemistry. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing you. Go ahead. Yeah, yes, thanks yes, for uh, recalling the importance of a seminar that you had in uh, Wedding Hall during your stay in Viola during 82 85. And, uh, and uh, we, we still continue to have the seminar program for our UG and the PG students. Uh, this is for your kind information. Oh, thank you. And uh, thanks, of course, for recalling the contributions of uh, former professors, Dr. E. S. Tinivas and Dr. Jnana Prakasam, uh, Professor Ram Murthy, Professor Santanam, and others. Uh, just a small clarification, sir. Uh, yeah. You mentioned uh, the rise and the fall in the level of uh, intracellular sodium. Yeah. Is found to be quite fast in the case of diabetic heart. Am I right? It, uh, I'm sorry, what is the question on diabetes? I'm, I missed that. Sorry. Can you repeat it, please? The rise and the fall in the level of uh, intracellular sodium. Yes. Uh, so is said to be fast in the case of a diabetic heart, you mentioned. Am I right? Yes. yes. Uh, why is that uh, quite fast, sir, in the case of diabetic heart? Yeah, there are two things that go on in the diabetic heart. So for the sodium to go up that high when it is facing stress, uh, there are uh, transporters in the heart, particularly the sodium hydrogen exchanger in the heart and the sodium, uh, uh, what is that, potassium chloride co-transporter in the heart. These are transporters that bring in sodium and the sodium pump brings uh, makes the sodium uh, go out of the heart. So what happens is in diabetes, you have the sodium pump that is impaired and you also have these co-transporter activities that are not optimal. And therefore what you see is whenever there is a heart attack in diabetic patient, the rise is much more rapid. Oh, okay, sir. That is, that is probably the reason why doctors say you must reduce your intake of uh, uh, salt, etc. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, because you don't want to give uh, that particular uh, one aspect is, you know, you need the sodium for it to go in and cause high levels, right? And therefore, you're basically reducing it. And as a consequence, you're able to minimize the injury. Yeah, the first thing the doctors usually say, you cut down uh, the consumption of pickle, puppet, all, uh, you know, salt related items. Yeah. Uh, True. And intake the increase of uh, vegetables, etc. Am I right, sir? Yeah. They are good sources of uh, potassium. All, all foods, vegetables. Yeah, the, the potassium goes in the opposite direction. The intracellular potassium is uh, high, uh, whereas uh, extracellular potassium is low. The extracellular potassium levels are between, uh, I would say, between 4 and 5. 0.5 millimolar in normally when you take the test. Potassium, uh, even in diabetics, it doesn't go that high uh, on the extracellular part. Uh, but I think or oh, as the people, diabetic patients uh, become more severely diabetic, that is possible later on in their uh, disease process. Oh, thank you, sir. Thanks for my sharing, sir. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, sir, sir, I just want to ask one more question again. Yeah, sure. Uh, sir, does these beta blockers yeah. play a very great role or does they like uh, disturb the ARI attenuation rise in the intracellular sodium during the ischemia? Yeah, so your question is, uh, does the beta blockers uh, affect the sodium uh, rise in uh, intracellular ischemia? Is that your question? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. The beta blockers, uh, they do affect the rise in intracellular sodium. Basically, what they do is they, uh, re they slow down the rise in intracellular sodium. Okay. And, the, and as a consequence, what happens is your energy deficit is much more pronounced, much more, uh, what do you call, manageable. Okay, and therefore they are, the beta blockers are able to protect the heart by uh, basically uh, by an indirect mechanism. And the primary function of beta blockers is to uh, basically influence the fatty acid metabolism, and secondary to which it also affects the sodium metabolism. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Uh, sir, I have a question. Sure. Okay. Uh, you have given uh, in your biodata that you have worked uh, 
in professor ad sheri's lab yeah where you have uh, done nmr studies in fact one of our uh, uh, my junior uh, professor v alexander student uh, is currently working there in the same uh, ad sheri's lab yes uh, is working on nmr uh, studies yeah so he's uh, yeah he's also working in the contrast enhancing agents yes Okay. Is there any possibility that uh, those uh, contrast enhancing agents can be used uh, to find out uh, this heart injuries? Injuries in the heart. Uh, is it possible for you? Yes. So any in the uh, the contrast agents again, uh, they are uh, slightly different from the shift-free agents. The contrast agents have gadolinium in the uh, for the lanthanoid, and the way the contrast agents work is to uh, enhance the uh, Uh, water contrast that is outside of the organ as opposed to inside of the organ so you get a better differentiation of the uh, anatomy itself uh, in order for the di- in for the diagnosis yes absolutely true there is something called a bold mri technique where it looks at the blood oxygen dependent uh, uh, contrast and uh, in the patients with heart attack or failing heart uh, the bold mri signals are quite impaired okay and using the contrast you are able to increase the sensitive sensitivity of the approach and yes uh, they they do use that approach uh, using the contrast agent uh, we used the contrast agent in the, one of the clinical trial studies that we are doing uh, to look at what goes on in the uh, uh, fat content in the muscle uh, in the heart and the hind uh, in the leg muscle oh, thank you sir thank you Sir, uh, Professor Ravi, one more clarification, sir. Uh, sure. The the present uh, generation, younger generation, uh, you know, seem to have a tendency towards uh, food uh, like uh, you know pizza, yeah. burger, KFC, all ba- baked items, bakery items. Yeah. Aerated drinks like uh, Pepsi, Coca Cola. Uh, yeah. Fried items, uh, chocolates, uh, burrata. What is your suggestion, uh, you know, regarding the consumption of these items? and uh, how far they affect uh, the heart uh, wellness of the heart of oh, an excellent point um so if you look at all the processed food what happens is uh your uh, Uh, basically you two things that you're doing there are there are adipocytes uh, in the in you know uh, in our body adipocytes are organs where the fatty acid metabolism is uh, regulated of course liver is another organ where it gets regulated so here what you're basically doing is uh, putting all these processed food adversely impact on the fatty acid uh, storage and fatty acid uh, you know metabolism and as a consequence what happens is that uh, you get all these uh, lipotoxic uh, species that are released in circulation for example ceramide long chain ceramide long chain acyl carnitines that are released actually are detrimental to the heart and it affects the uh, the uh, cardiac function itself for example if you have uh, high levels of uh, long chain acyl carnitines the heart rhythm becomes irregular and it leads to a phenomenon called arrhythmia or in a simple term it's like the palpitation uh, it is the irregular uh, you know like a you know the heart goes into a rapid beat and then slows down and then a uh, rapid beat again it's sort of like uh, you know people get scared and when you take them to the hospital what happens is that the doctor the cardiologist would diagnose and say oh you've had uh, irregular heart rhythm it is called arrhythmia okay and that's what that is likely to happen and, and i think some of the processed food have to be handled in a very very uh, careful manner and again it's unfortunate if you look at the uh, advent of all these processed food obesity has gone up the cardiovascular disease has gone up so we stick to what my grandmother would say in the late 60s and 70s don't eat anything that you don't know what it contains that's the best uh, advice i would give yes sir good sir Don't eat anything that uh, you don't know what it contains. Correct. Yeah. Our yeah. Uh, normal Tamil culture, the certain kind of food, idli, yeah. dosa, etc. They are the best food, sir. Absolutely. I mean, I I would love to uh, engage with you on this because this is some uh, hobby of mine to really look at uh, some of the systemic uh, behavior in the old days and how it had uh, uh, given to good quality of life as opposed to what we are seeing now. Yeah. Yes, sir. Students, you can if you have got any. Sir, yeah. sir, one more clarification I got. 
I'm very interested in this field. Actually, I am. I'm a dropout medical student just to get into a Loyola college. I just dropped off and came to this college. It's okay. a kind pleasure of mine to meet you with the same thing. So, sir, I just want to ask one more question again. We, sure. You discussed something about diabetes mellitus. Diabetes yeah. mellitus, it's of two types. So, type 1 and type 2. Sir, yeah. so which type does this diabetes cause more injury to heart? Type 1 or type 2? Uh, both of them cause uh, heart disease. So equally, uh, it, by uh, you know, some of the mechanisms are common. There are distinct mechanisms in type one. Uh, that is basically uh, what my lab has been working on. I think uh, I see Professor Jevarajan having a question. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, um, Ravi, I need to thank you. Like uh, again. Um, for your spending time here with the students, okay, yeah, it's a, it gives me an immense pleasure. Like uh, when students come back, okay, and the journey, and I wanted to tell the audience also, it is a very competitive environment to make progress in this field because so the, to get an NH grant uh, for multiple grants, okay, what uh, Ravi had and the progress he made, and all the way to the clinical part, it is not a joke, okay. So so his perseverance and the enthusiasm as you have seen now that is the one that keeps you afloat okay and there will be a uh, kind of uh, um, setbacks okay but um you you saw his enthusiasm right that is the one that keeps you along okay uh, along this journey so i wanted to acknowledge it before um before the end of the meeting so thanks again ravi and so it's my continue. pleasure thank you for the opportunity no Uh, th thank you. Uh, in the absence of any other question, uh, I would like to call on the uh, MC to go on with a word of thanks. Please proceed. Thank you very much, sir, for this exemplary presentation. And Gratitude turns what we have into enough. As we have reached the end of today's discussion, with all due respect, I welcome Vice President of Loyola Chemical Society, Dr. Lima Sophie, to propose the word of thanks. Uh, in the absence of any other question, uh, I'd like to call on the uh, MC to go on with a word of thanks. Please proceed. Thank you very much, sir, for this exemplary presentation. And Gratitude turns what we have into enough. As we have reached the end of today's disposition, with all due respect, I welcome Vice President of Loyola Chemical Society, Dr. Lima Sophie, to propose the vote of thanks. Sir, the vote of thanks is not audible, sir. Um, in the absence of any question, no, it's not audible, sir. Uh, we'd like to call on the uh, MC to go on with the vote of thanks. Please, Thank you very much. Sir, it is getting repeated. It's not audible. Your word of thanks is not audible. It is getting repeated, your voice. Suresh, did you see the uh, this thing audio issue? Did you see that? Uh, uh, 
Rish, can you hand it over to MC so, so they, they, they can follow through? Blessings and grace, we were able to make the event what it was. My heartfelt thanks to Reverend Harold Rector, who is our source of inspiration and guidance all our staff. I also thank Reverend Harold Rector. Justin Prabhu, Mr. Sudhakar, the Office of Media Relation people for the technical support. At last, I thank you all for being with us. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thanks, Ravi, again. And uh, thanks, Rish, and every one of you okay, for attending. Yeah. Thank you. So, Rish, for the next set, like you can give me those dates, okay? So, at some point. Thank you, sirs. Thank you. Are you able to hear me? Yes, thank guess, you very yeah, much. We can hear you. Yeah, only yes, the thanks giving, uh, we could not hear you. Thank but, uh, this, yeah, I think somewhere, uh, some kind of technical snag took place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. In YouTube and uh, uh, the Meet got uh, merged together at this point. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank okay. you, uh, Professor Vichandran, sir. Yeah, it's a great thank thing you. that you have able to come and uh, share your uh, expertise with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeev sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank Probably you. I'll talk to you later, okay? So, later this week. Okay, okay thank no you. No problem. No. Yeah. Okay, bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining with us in this particular uh, webinar. Probably uh, we'll be having more to come in the future. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Wish you all a happy good evening and you can leave the meet. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.